What's good, y'all? Shabo Ross back at again with another video. So we're gonna check out ten dreadful wrestling tropes that need to die. This should be a very interesting one. Wrestling tropes have been a part of the wrestling business, obviously, for a very long time. Some of them make sense. For example, when you have a tag team match and a wrestler is crawling and they're trying to get to their teammate even though they just hit a move where they were just standing up they're like so out of energy yes it is a trope that we've seen so many times but the psychology for it for the fans in attendance it gets the fans riled up the other person on the other side of the turnbuckle trying to hype up the crowd and you know trying to extend his hand to finally get the tag and then just at the last minute they jump and they tag uh their partner and then you get that hot tag and the crowd is amped up yes it's kind of silly when you think about it it happens pretty much all the time in tag team wrestling matches but it makes sense to get the crowd in invested it's part of the psychology of the match so it would be interesting if that's on the list because i do think that's appropriate but let's see what else is on the list that uh people feel like shouldn't be on uh shouldn't be a thing anymore in wrestling appreciate all love and support let's get right into this one man if the majority of wrestling fans had it their way you can bet that each and every one of the following frustrating uninspired and all kinds of dumb tropes would be permanently terminated from the business altogether after watching this very list so with that in mind I am did he kick out? this is what culture <laughs> wrestling and here are 10 dreadful wrestling tropes that need to die number 10 kick out at 2.999 after a move that never works not all mm. desperate kickouts are equal. For every jaw-dropping, seemingly impossible explosion of energy from an almost certainly finished person right as victory was slipping away, there's sadly a far more common visual of a wrestler fully believing they've sealed the win with a move, only for their adversary to inevitably escape defeat late on. Yeah. The likes of Sami Zayn and Seth Rollins with their Blue Thunderbomb and Falcon Arrow combo, respectively, have been the most notable offenders over the mm -hmm. years. If these stars simply accepted that the move in question was never going to get the job done, Done, folks could probably forgive the odd instinctive pin attempt. But the fact these workers continually slap the most artificial <laughs> shocked face imaginable on their foolish mugs in the aftermath has turned this one into a hugely annoying wrestling trope. What is your favorite signature move? Let me know. And, and that's, that's a fair point because they barely win with those moves. It would be different if they built those moves up and I wish WWE and just more wrestling companies would do this. It's okay if the signature move puts away somebody i'm okay with that i'm okay with certain moves putting no it don't always have to be the finisher sometimes a, a signature move is just as devastating looking and to put away a, an opponent do that i think recently kevin owens on this recent episode of uh of smackdown i think it was one of the qualifying matches uh if, i believe it was against dominic um he hit i think he hit him with the pop-up power bomb he didn't even hit him with his uh new finisher the uh, the stunner he hit him with the pop-up power bomb and won the match that's perfect have these wrestlers have if they have cool signatures they don't have to always win with their finishers because that way when someone does kick out their finisher then it's like damn now i gotta that means when someone kicks out their signature Damn, they can sell the 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 shock like damn they kicked out. I may have to use my finisher, and then the crowd can be like damn they kicked out of that. He's gonna have to use his finisher, so it it adds the extra layer of anticipation for the actual finisher. So yeah, they should start doing that more. In the comment section right down below. Number nine, the you people rant one week after turning heel. Yep. One thing seems to be frustratingly certain <laughs> in the wake people. of just about every babyface's decision to turn their back on the life of a good guy or gal. That sudden attitude adjustment will be swiftly followed by a monologue blasting all of you people in attendance and watching around the world. Yep. Take Jungle Boy Jack Perry's first real heel moment on the mic earlier this year, for example. Just a few days after finally snapping at Forbidden Door and turning on his pal Hook, the A W Pillar had swiftly shifted from slightly frustrated mm -hmm. underdog face to a completely irritating and trope-stuffed villain. Yeah. The entire thing felt like a parody more than a game-changing character shift. Perry isn't alone, of course. This sort of unoriginal targeting of the audience and tropey post-turn promo has become the stale norm nowadays. Number eight, a dive to the outside. Yeah, here's the thing. Not every heel has to have this innate hate for the fans all of a sudden. It depends on the character. It depends on why they turned heel. Sometimes a person, for example, 
Drew, what they've done with his heel turn has been great because he hasn't, he's not doing this. All you people have turned on me. No, he's looking at himself as the savior of WrestleMania. He's looking at himself as the good guy, but he's doing bad things. He's being a hypocrite and that's what works. That's a perfect heel turn. He's a he's a he's an asshole, but he's not blaming the people. He thinks he's helping the people. He thinks he's doing great. He thinks he's the good guy in his story. That's really all a heel is. Someone that feels like they're the good guy in their own story. So I I I'm that's a fair assessment. When you start getting into the you people tropes, eh, come on now. You was just just hugging all the babies last week. Now it's you people make me sick. <laughs> I'd means a commercial is coming your way. What's the easiest way to tell if a two minute chunk of fast food marketing is heading your way mid wrestling show? Why your favorite in ring workers opting to chuck their bodies outside of the squared circle, of course. More often than not, leads to an advertisement or two pulling you away from the action. How yeah. this particular trope has become so terribly predictable, fans even find themselves feeling a little uneasy when a tope doesn't force their experience experience into a tiny square for a few minutes on pay-per-view. Would it be so bizarre to simply hot to a Burger King advert seconds after a performer just about survives being choke slammed right down to hell? Well, apparently yeah. so. Number seven, I have hit you with- And uh, you definitely do see that a lot more, and I ain't gonna lie to you, dude. They, they, that's how they set it up. It goes through the, through the ropes, hits someone, and then gets back into the ring, and then they cut to commercial break. So that, that's another fair one, too. This weapon, now we must have a match with this weapon. You didn't need this list to tell you oh, that the wonderful man. world of professional wrestling isn't half a silly one at the best of times. And the way many a vicious stipulation encounter has found itself being booked on an incoming pay-per-view or PLE. Just look at this year's Double or Nothing pay-per-view. Right before a surprising ladder match between himself and the despicable Christian Cage was made official for the May 28th show, you'll never guess what Big Bad Wardlow was randomly battered with on Dynamite. It was painfully obvious where all this was going before the then TNT champion opted to challenge the patriarch of AEW to the stipped-up pay-per-view war. The mm -hmm. fact weapons-based contests are still occasionally being set up in this non-exactly creative way in 2023 is unquestionably disappointing. Number 6, the Royal Rumble season top rope nonsense. Royal mm. Rumble season is right around the corner, and you know what that means. Just about every single person who isn't involved in a title match at that January PLE is about to be spending a month attempting to avoid being tossed over the top rope. Why? Yep. Well, because Michael Cole and Corey Graves need to be able to remind fans who have been loyally watching the product <laughs> for a decade or so exactly what the rules of the incoming Royal Rumble contests are, silly. Even if you are tuning into WWE programming for the very first time right now, there's a solid chance you'll be able to figure out what said routinely gripping bout yeah. involves by simply watching one of the many Rumble highlight packages online. But no, that is simply not enough, folks. You must watch people fly over the top rope for five to six weeks. Number five, <laughs> distraction roll-ups. WWE don't half love the sight of distracted performers being rolled up out of nowhere. The idea behind the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, distraction combo, salute to the mighty Simon Miller, is that this annoying trope of a finish protects both of the individuals involved. In theory, the winner comes away with an all-important victory, and mm -hmm. loser is given a justification for failing to defeat their foe. In reality, though, this cheap conclusion does little to nothing for anyone, and pretty much renders the entire bout as pointless. Yeah. If nobody really wins cleanly or in a way that properly helps their character grow slash get more over with a the crowd, then surely everyone just loses, right? Number four, cheap city and, and that, that, that's, that's a fair one. I, it always baffles me how someone could be, they get distracted and then they get hit with an easy roll up. I'm like, damn, bro. Like you, it's like you forgot you were in an actual match with someone that's trying to beat you up. <laughs> And all because someone came out ringside instead of just still focusing what's happening. Now, it's different to get on the ring apron and they distract the ref. Okay, that's different. But just them walking out or you hear the music, oh, you see it, but you still focus on the match. I've always felt that was kind of silly. Like, damn, bro, they, they lost the match because a person was standing outside the ring or up at the ramp. And they just lost all awareness of what's going on. It's, it's fucking funny, bro. <laughs> 
preference heel slash babyface pops. Taking a quick look at the name of the town slash city on the schedule that week, picking uh -huh. one of their many sports teams, before then either crapping on or celebrating said foot basket baseball squad. Yep. The cheap saluting or blasting of whatever country or city a performer finds themselves performing in will never not be dull to just watch anywhere else. Now sure, there's the odd sensational exception. Elias and Kevin Owens' outrageously loud Seattle bashing yeah. segment remains iconic. Facts. But there have been far more examples of wrestlers chucking out deeply unimaginative compliments and criticisms at the place they're standing in over the years. Number three, two enemies are tag- And sometimes it can work. Sometimes it works, like the Kevin Owens and Elias situation, and sometimes it's just like, ah. Uh, but we understand why it's done. For viewers watching on TV, it's like, uh, okay. But for people in the arena, it gets, it's able to get that cheap heat to, you know, get the, get the crowd, you know, active. So I understand why it's done, but it can be annoying to see, especially if it doesn't really get that much of a reaction anyway. So. Bugging, but can they coexist? For every MJF and Adam Cole or Salt of the Earth and Samoa Joe example of enemies being forced to coexist in a tag environment and making it work, uh -huh. there has still been the odd frustrating time when the likes of WWE and AEW have opted to chuck enemies into a unit together just for the pair to inevitably turn on each other yeah. at some point <laughs> in the mayhem. So Coming into this year's WrestleMania, WWE stupidly opted to have two of their best workers in the women's division just bicker a little in a tag bout before Asuka obviously targeted her partner, Raw Women's Champion Bianca uh -huh. Belair, before the biggest PLE of the year. No epic or unexpected story, just yeah. two talented women who couldn't get along before a mania contest. Yep. Put simply, despite the occasional coexisting hit, most would be happy to see this done-to-death trope super kicked out of the business entirely heading into 2024. Number I would definitely love to see that trope get done away. It should... It, you know what's gonna happen. Someone's gonna betray each other or whatever. Uh, it's it's a tired trope. I really do wish they would do away with that because you're not surprising anybody. Will they? Won't they coexist? No one cares. They're about to fight each other for the championship or whatever in the upcoming pay per view. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? To powering through the goon gauntlet to get to the heel leader. Both uh, the world of sports entertainment and the elite alternative have often become obsessed with chucking their baby faces into grueling battles, which see them having to overcome a number of the heels' pals in order to get their hands on a glorious opportunity, either to face their bitter enemy or challenge for a strap. The concept was strong for a time, but after watching what feels like 300 of them in different shapes and sizes go down on AEW TV in particular over the last few years, mm -hmm. it's to say the majority of all elite lovers would prefer it if the fighting through Jericho Appreciation Societies in one night was stripped away from the modern wrestling product. WWE seems to have a habit of booking this sort of predictable road to a champion or top villain too, yeah. with the likes of Gunter and Roman Reigns often making their enemies battle against their Imperium or Bloodline allies before they can share the ring with real greatness. Number one, mid-match mon- And... That's a double-edged sword because that's the whole purpose why you have a, a group or a faction. So the top guy can be protected and everyone else are the lackeys, the flunkies, and they're there to provide a barrier before the, the guy gets to the ultimate boss. So I understand why it happens. I mean, that's usually right now in wrestling, the top guys, outside of a few individuals, but the top guys usually have a team of people to help them. Not everybody, but that's been kind of a trend. And it's always been like that in wrestling, to be honest with you. The, the top bad guys usually had a group of people to help them. Simple as that. And you had to kind of maneuver your way through these people. And we're seeing it with Cody right now. He's going to have to get more help on his side of things to kind of maneuver his way to, to really finally get that that true one-on-one -on -one with Roman without as much, you know, to neutralize his his bloodline as much as possible. So I get what he's saying, but at the same time, I think it 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 needs to be that way if you have a dominant strong heel and you have a faction. I think you have to do it that way because it doesn't make sense if all of a sudden he just goes for the boss and then all the lackeys are just there watching it happen. What's the point of having them, you know? So... I think this is a kind of a, it has to kind of happen in certain instances.
monologue in. Largely inspired by the tribal chief's insistence on creating magical cinema with all of the people sitting around his table. Initially, Roman Reigns leaning into the drama via verbal assault on the likes of Jay Uso and Kevin Owens during the Thunderdome era wasn't actually all that terrible. However, the undisputed mm -hmm. WWE Universal Champion opting to stick to cutting promos during an intense battle when live fans returned led to many more taking a page out of Reigns' script. Seth Rollins is another who simply cannot resist throwing in some additional exposition, reminding Shinsuke Nakamura that he brought his family into their feud, and telling those watching at home the risks he takes bumping on a battered back. They know Seth the entire program told them for weeks. <laughs> but why bother telling that story through masterful selling and the layout of a contest when he can just spell it out to those silly fans via excruciating monologuing instead, eh? I've been Gareth from What Culture Wrestling. I don't know Thank about you, this as one. Always, for watching this video today. Hopefully, we'll see you again rather soon. But in the meantime, just be good to yourself. Yeah, I don't know about this one. I, me personally, I'm okay with them talking trash. Like the heel is talking trash or they're kind of going back and forth. Like I'm okay with that. It adds that layer of intensity to the actual match itself. Not saying that the entire time should, it should be like that. It depends on the character. Roman Reigns, it fits him. He's going to talk trash. He's been doing it. He's going to keep doing it because he feels he's invincible. So it's supposed to be like that. It makes it that much better. I'm all for it. So me personally, I don't know if I would have put this one at number one. I think this is a trope that you could kind of work with. Obviously, everyone shouldn't be doing it. And it depends on the character and what's being said and why it's being said. But at the same time, I do understand how some people can feel like, oh, well, you know, back in the day, wrestlers didn't really talk too much in the sense of talking trash during the match but at the same time you've seen clips of wrestlers doing that so me personally i don't know if i would have put this number one this has been a very interesting list some of these things on this particular list i wouldn't i don't feel like they're bad tropes i feel like they're part of keeping the wrestling business the way it is and and not saying that it's a bad thing or you know it's the best thing that's going on right now but i think it it, it works so i don't feel like some of the stuff needs to be taken away or changed so y'all comment down below let me know what tropes you feel like should be kind of removed or died you know fought, died back dialed back um in the wrestling business as a whole because uh, i feel like a lot on this particular list i wouldn't really have a problem with some of them make sense for sure like the the whole teaming up with your enemy before you're about to fight them at the next pay-per-view yes please get rid of that it doesn't create that much story unless it makes sense to do that most of the shit most of the time it doesn't so get rid of that for sure but comment down below let me know some other tropes you feel like could have been on this list or should have been on this list that you feel like yeah let's get rid of it but i appreciate all the love and support road to 150k and i'm still young speedy youtube wrestling champion of the world appreciate y'all kidding me see you on the next one peace